autism is in the news all the time, it seems, and uh, it certainly appears as though it's increasing in uh, frequency, and it's unclear how much of that is due to an increase in diagnosis uh, and recognition versus how much of that is triggered by other environmental factors. But uh, there doesn't seem to be much um, confusion around the fact that there's a strong genetic component to it. So let's start with that. Uh, based on all of the twin studies, uh, what is the heritability of autism? Yep. So the heritability, I, I will say to your point, um, autism is even within the name, a spectrum. Um, so it's not just one condition, it's a spectrum, and it goes from uh, severe, um, what some people will call profound autism, um, and can be associated with intellectual disabilities to other individuals at the mild, quote unquote, milder end, um, who are, have, have, are quite talented in many ways, yet have social challenges. So within that entire spectrum, if one includes everything within that, the heritability is estimated to be approximately 0.8, although some individuals will say even as high as 0.9. Um, the point within that, though, is that it's not 100%. And in fact, we do know of um, times over the life course, in particular prenatal and early childhood that are important to the developing brain and where uh, changes in exposure beyond the genes can play a role. So as an example, prematurity is one of the more common, if you will, exposures, uh, but in terms of what happens to the de developing brain. And if you are born when you're 26 weeks old, um, much higher probability of autism than if you're born at term at 40 weeks. And so um, there are other factors beyond just the genes that are involved. But clearly, um, the other th point that I'll make about heritability is one calculates heritability as a measure of the inherited genetic factors. Um, but you've mentioned it once already. One of the factors in autism is that there are de novo or new genetic variants that occur for the first time in the individual with autism. And those individuals aren't captured in that measure of heritability because heritability is fundamentally trying to get at transmitted genetic variants that are going from parent to child. And those de novo genetic events are new in the child. And so there are genetic aspects not included in heritability, if that makes sense. Yep. Yep. So what are the genes that seem to be responsible for autism? Uh, so depending on who you ask and how you want to define this, there I think everyone would agree there are at least 100 genes that have been identified with high confidence as being associated with autism. Um, depending on how rigorous you want to be about this process, then you know some people would say that we estimate that there are at least a thousand genes, and we probably you know are about a third of the way there in terms of uh, having some sense of those genes. Not surprisingly, those genes are genes that are in the brain. They're expressed in the brain. They function in the brain, not surprisingly. And many of those genes are especially early or active during development. And so what I mean is intrauterine fetal uh, development within the brain specifically. And what do they code for? I mean, how many of those genes would be genes in the exome versus the intron? So um, most of the ones we recognize underscore the ones we recognize are in the coding sequence, but that's a limitation of what we recognize. Um, we do realize that statistically, we see that there is a signal in the non-coding space, but we have less evidence to implicate specific genes or specific genetic variants individually in the non-coding space because the effect size or how powerful they are is somewhat somewhat reduced compared to those coding sequences. The other issue is not just where in the genes, uh, but what genes are involved. And so the genes that are involved uh, fundamentally can be genes that function at the synapse. So the connections between brain cells and communicate between brain cells, that happens to be one thing that's quite important. Um, they can be cells that are, or rather genes that are important in regulation of genes and gene networks. So many of them are transcription factors, histone modifiers. We talked even about epigenetics, some of those genes that may be responsible for those epigenetic changes. But they often, I think of them as having multiple downstream genes that they affect. So it's not having a very, you know, sort of focus. It's more a universal effect that they have. 
those genes that have that more global effect oftentimes have a more global effect on brain function and cognition. So it may not be that it's autism only, but they may also be associated with intellectual disabilities. They may be associated with epilepsy. They may be associated with more sort of global effects in terms of brain function. And to the extent that that term autism is used across the spectrum, there are oftentimes those individuals described as profound autism. So there can be different things. There can also be, uh, I'll just put as an example, um, we mentioned, I'll go back to PKU, believe it or not. So I, I happen to run a very large autism study called SPARK. Uh, and within SPARK, we identified a teenage young man who actually has his autism as a responsible of undiagnosed PKU. So mm -hmm. even, even autism can be caused by by, you know, full circle, uh, an inborn error of metabolism where there are toxic things that build up in the brain and then cause that dysfunction of the brain. So uh, not everything is a sort of primarily in terms of the brain, but things that can diffuse to and have an effect on the function of the brain. But to be clear, autism is a clinical diagnosis in the same way that you know, familial hypercholesterolemia is a familial, uh, is a phenotypic diagnosis. It's a diagnosis in the case of FH where LDL cholesterol has to be above 190 milligrams per deciliter off treatment. And it's incredibly heterogeneous in terms of the genes that are responsible. To my last count, I think there were more than 3,500 genes that could produce that phenotype of high LDL cholesterol. So autism is the same, right? The diagnosis is clinical. It's a phenotypic dis defined disease and maybe up to a thousand genes involved in, in that or a thousand different ways to get there or more, right? Exactly right. So it is a DSM diagnosis in terms of clinical behavioral criteria. Um, I know this gets confusing for people, but one can have a gene that's identified as causal, but the diagnosis is still a behavioral diagnosis, um, simply a gene associated with that. And as you said, not just one single gene, it doesn't map one to one. And in fact, no one gene or genetic factor accounts for more than 1% of individuals who have that clinical diagnosis of autism. So incredibly heterogeneous. And what's the approximate prevalence of autism today? So round numbers, 2%. Uh, you were alluding to it before, but this number has fluctuated over time, whether it's for all the reasons you said, but about 2% today. Does it just seem like it's more, or is this really a function of greater awareness? So I think it's a function of several things. Um, it doesn't help that the definition has changed over time. So literally the DSM diagnostic criteria have changed over time. And so for that, not surprising, the uh, prevalence has changed over time. Um, in a good way, the, there is greater recognition and diagnosis, as you alluded to. We've seen this in particular for underserved individuals that are more frequently diagnosed now. So I think the disparities are decreasing, and I think that's a good thing. Um, but there are um, also, I'll, I'll say, you know, Maybe there are things that are changing in terms of society, um, changing the biology. I don't know. Uh, we haven't been able to put our finger on that, but there are possible contributing factors with that. Um, and then there's also a motivation to a certain extent in terms of the way our society works to be able to access resources. And so people that may not have been motivated to get a label per se, they may still have known it. They may have you know, thought it to themselves, but they didn't necessarily seek a diagnosis or a label, um, except that there were resources educational resources, support resources that were important, and we want to make sure those individuals get those resources. So what are some other both neurologic and non-neurologic sequelae of autism, or call it comorbid conditions with autism? So I think that's a good way to phrase it. Comorbid conditions is one of the things that um, I think about. So as an example, some individuals will have epilepsy associated with their autism. For some individuals, that epilepsy will be recognized very early. For some individuals, it won't come until the teenagers or adolescents, but that can be incredibly important. Um, within this, there are behavioral uh, uh, co-occurring diagnoses, for instance, of anxiety is quite frequent. Uh, ADHD or attention issues, uh, again, quite frequent. Um, and I think some things we're just beginning to understand, although I think it's incredibly important, is that most of what we know about autism is based on individuals below the age of 20. Um, those are the individuals who've been studied most. And I think there's a whole lot we don't know about adults with autism. And I can say I do know some conditions that are associated um, 
as degenerative conditions as well, that when people are adults, there may be particular subtypes of autism that are neurodegenerative because the genes that are involved are responsible for neuro maintenance, being able to sustain the brain and continue functioning. And when they're not functioning at some point, uh, start having things associated like Parkinsonism. Um, some subtypes that may be associated with increased risk of, we mentioned obesity, but be, believe it or not, some of these same genes may also predispose to obesity, and especially with some of the medications we use to treat some of these behavioral conditions, uh, even increase the effects, the metabolic effects and weight gain and, and diabetes associated with that. Um, and there may be other things as well, but to a large extent, um, I would say it's under-recognized and, and we have a lot of more gaps in our knowledge, but many people who continue to need those that understanding. And I think earlier you used a term of precision medicine. I, I don't mean it to sound like a cliche, but you can imagine that it's a large percentage, 2% of the population, great heterogeneity. Everyone doesn't need to have the same sort of rules that they're following, the same rule book or the same management guidelines. And how do we get greater specificity to not overburden people, but yet to be able to also, um, you know, allow them to be their, their full, to achieve their full potential and lead their healthiest lives. You mentioned that most of what we know about autism is based on studying people who are up to but below typically 20 years old. Does that suggest that prior to about the year 2000, there was nobody really studying this? Because presumably, if we were, we would know about what people look like later in life today. Yep. So many of the adults with autism, number one, were not diagnosed as having autism. They may have had, you know, some of these challenges, but things have just changed over time. Um, and so having a label, having a diagnosis has changed with society. Um, other individuals who were studied 20 years ago have not been followed longitudinally. And that's hard. Um, you know, there, although there have been some epidemiological studies like Framingham uh, that have followed individuals over long periods of time, it's hard to be able to do that. People move, people, you know, investigators lose funding, um, people die. I mean, you know, lots of things that happen. And so just knowing what someone looked like at two and that same person at 22, there are very few studies uh, in terms of in children, what that looks like. And so I think that's been a large part of the problem as well. Mm -hmm.